He says, do not cast pearls before swine, for they may turn on you and trample the swirls and devour you. Yes. Yes. So why would you do it towards someone that is not listening and is Brilliant. The reason why, and that's a great question, very valid, good question to ask in this park. Why is it I know I'm debating people who are insincere, so they are the pigs that Jesus is talking about, and yet I still evangelize them? It's not because of them. It's because of the thousands of people that watch these videos. That's why I debate these insincere people. It's because of all of you people that are sincerely listening to me. I debate the malicious people and the insincere people here for you. Really a pleasure to meet you. You too, brother. I, I just want to say that as Christians, we need to, like, we need to change the way we're doing Christianity in this country. Right? A lot of us have been brought up in wimpy churches to be wimpy. Yeah. Right? And that's killing the church. Yeah. Right? So get yourself into the gym. Amen. Get yourself into some martial arts, preferably boxing, kickboxing, or, or something along those lines. A real martial art, not these esoteric ones from China. Yeah. Right? Like, you know, and, 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 and learn your faith. And own your faith. Possess your faith in its fullest. Yeah. Acad in every sense. I mean, I'd like to think that I'm academically wise and intellectual in some sense because I have done a lot of readings and research into yeah. the religion of Christianity yeah. and also the religion of Islam to establish truth. Yeah. And I do believe quite a lot of the time yeah. when it comes down with cultural Christians, which are the predominantly the Christians in this country today. Yeah. If they ask a simple question like, who is God or why do you believe in Christianity? It's because mainly because their parents brought them up in the church or yeah. because their grandparents are Christians. Yeah. They can't really give you a specific answer as to yeah. why they're a Christian. Like, well, I believe in Christianity because I've done the research. I believe that every, my lifestyle in which I live as a Christian gives about success and yeah. every prosperity and everything that a Christian lifestyle should give. Well, the, 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 the Christian lifestyle gives us a set of values, a set of ethics, identity. an identity, a sense of history, a system of doctrine, um, and, and, it, and it gives us all of these things and we've got to own it and possess it fully. And that, that's the difference between a muscular Christianity, which is what you hear me talk about all the time, oh, yeah. Right? And the wimpy kind of ritual Christianity that is the main bread of churches like the Church of England. Yeah. Right? They it's, give into cultural They give norms. into cult yes, they yeah. give into cultural norms. Yeah. But the reason why they give into cultural norms is because they have a massive cultural blind spot. Yeah. Because we've divorced our faith from values and ethics. And we've divorced our faith from the idea that we three are the people of God. Which means that when we meet together regularly, <coughs> certain decorums and certain practices are going to emerge naturally yeah. out of us meeting regularly, and that forms a culture. And I feel like because we haven't got that culture now, people are losing their faith in yes. what they originally was an identity, yes. or was a practice or set of values. Yes. So it's kind of like evangelical commitment to a sort of Catholic culture mm. is the, the kind of thing that I'm trying to get Christians to see, to connect those two things up. I do have one question though. Yeah. You're quite ecumenical. Yes. In that you believe in what the singular established body of Christ. Yes. You believe that if we're united we can fight what the evils of Islam, for example, or anything yes. that's heretical. Yes. I've got some questions in the sense that how can we be ecumenical when there's some like Protestants and some Catholics that are constantly opposed to one another because of minor doctrinal issues? Yeah, well the reality is you're never gonna get those people to unite. Yeah. So why waste your time? Yeah. Like in this park, there are sectarian Christians who won't associate with me, yeah. who badmouth me to others, and who spread division amongst Christians in this park. How do you counter that? I don't. I just let I leave them be. And what I do is I work with the willing. But they have a following. So, so, so I can't. You... No, I don't bother. No. And my advice to you is, don't waste your time with a sectarian Christian. Mm. The moment someone gets sectarian, just, just, just. Uh, devoid yourself from that conversation, devoid yourself from that energy um, and pull away from it and work with Christians from any denomination yeah. that are willing to work together for the good. Okay. What would you define good? The good is that establishment in terms of society, the good is that establishment of laws based on Christian values and principles, um, the practice of the Christian faith, bel Christian belief, Christian belief, and, 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 and that's the kind of thing that I would say is the good. We to, define good yeah. by Christian. Yeah. And I don't do that apologetically. I don't seek to dilute that. I'm not looking for a compromise with liberalism. I'm not looking for a compromise with Islam. Wherever any ideology, no matter what it is, contradicts <laughs> Christianity, I believe 
that we should take territory and it is the opposition that should give ground, not us. There is one thing though I've noticed in your videos. I know you do appeal to rationality and logic and intellectual ability. Yeah. But I think quite a lot of the time the way humans are in terms of their nature, people don't tend to align with rationality as such but more emotional empathy. Yes. And I think sometimes you have to be more empathetic towards certain people, like especially if they're younger. Yeah. Or if they're like I don't know, a university student for example who yeah. are obviously con confused themselves and yeah. they have more like empathy towards their own problems yeah. and such. And I don't think really like this environment is not for them, but if they do come here, I think it's nice to, you know. Well, the, real the reality is, I mean, I, I think sometimes I'm so used to debating confrontational people yeah. that I kind of slip into a confrontational mode even when I don't need to. That's, that's a fault that I've witnessed in myself. And, and this environment and the, these, this kind of evangelism is, doesn't lend itself to um, emotional empathy in the sense of counselling. But good intelligent argument requires emotional intelligence. So you've got to be able to pick up on where the other person is coming from. And sometimes you have to prick a bubble so it pops, and other times you have to rub balm on a wound so it heals. And you try to do both in this environment. I know one but of I th things you said in the past what? as well was that you have to plant the seeds. Yeah. But I don't think the seeds can be planted as such if you're not like getting, not, not, it's not like you're not getting the point of view, but if you're so like certain in what you believe and they don't believe it, I think yeah. you have to kind of... Well, I mean, the thing is, that there's, 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 there's other points that I want to raise connected to this same issue, which is that the other thing is that it, the evangelism is not just to the person I'm talking to, it's to the thousands of people that then watch the video later. And part of my audience and part of what I'm thinking is, what are these people? Because there are Muslims watching our videos that are becoming Christians in a way that Muslims in this part could never do. But they can when they watch a video at home. They do and you should. Now, but the point is, there's another thing that I think is really important. There's something missing in our evangelism. And that is, especially to men, Right, you get back the energy you put out, right? If we want men to come to faith, we've got to put out a masculine energy. And we've got to give men a vision of what it is to be a Christian man that is not wimpy, that is not diluted, that is not soy boy-like, that's not limp-wristed. Can you be a Christian who's soy boy-like or limp-wristed? Unfortunately, yes, you can, because it's not, it's a salvation issue. But the th it's not a salvation issue. But the thing is, if you, if you are, if you are, are with the church has kind of fallen into the trap of what Marcus Aurelius talked about when he said, you don't want your thinking done by cowards and your fighting done by fools. Because if your thinking is done by cowards, then you end up like having in the intelligence of a coward. Are you if, you, if you fight like a fool, you fight like a brute. What we as Christians particularly need to do is to cultivate the idea of the Christian knight, which is this idea of the warrior scholar. The man that, if someone comes at him physically, can stand his ground in a fight, can defend his brothers and sisters, can defend the church, but at the same time, if you come to him with intelligent questions, he can give you intelligent answers. Yeah. And that's where we need to be to cultivate masculinity back in the church again. Is that for every Christian man, or is it for a set of Christians that are called to do so? I would say that it's for every Christian man, but to different degrees. Okay. Because depending on your calling, Obviously, you're going to be able more or less to embody this. If your calling is to be a soldier, right, it's less important that you're a scholar of books than it is you're a scholar of rifles. But if you're called to be the evangelist like me, you're called more to be a scholar of books than you are of rifles. But I try to embody both, and hopefully every Christian soldier would embody both. One so thing I've noticed, especially when people try and become this masculine Christian, is that they go out so confident, like into areas like this, where yeah. there's a lot of Muslims who are well versed and have their scripts and have their yeah. preconceived vision of Christianity. Yeah. And they come here and they think they know what they're talking about, yeah. and they get completely demolished. Yes, and it's foundation. and it's because and it tells you it tells you how much masculinity has been lost in the church. Mm. That when Christians try to embody what I'm saying, the first mistake that they make is they over exaggerate, they overcompensate, like. Like, the, the reality is, you, you need to cultivate inner strength, inner solidity of the soul. The Bible says on so many occasions, be strong in the faith, be steadfast in the faith. Well, if we're taking our discipleship seriously, why are we not cultivating inner firmness in our hearts? And when we've cultivated inner firmness in our hearts about what we believe, 
then that starts to imbue into the rest of your life. And it's about you increase this energy, you don't overcompensate for its absence. So you have an honest understanding of where you are, and you have an honest understanding of where you need to be, and you take the journey to get from point A to point B. And that's what discipleship is about. And that's how you do discipleship. Any other questions, bro? How would you know what your calling is? Great question. Um, so in terms of your calling, I would give you seven keys of interpretation. The first... Kind of in my eyes here. Do you mind if I stand here? Yeah, we can swap. Right? So seven keys of interpretation. The first one is, have you got a passion for it? I want to include you, bro, but... Okay. Right. So the first one is, you've got to have a passion for it. So what passion has God put in your heart? The second thing to ask is, is, do you have the skill to do that passion? If God has called you to be a singer, a worship leader, right? But you don't, you can't hold a tune and you don't know music at all, then perhaps you should be thinking that that's not your calling. But perhaps you've got a passion for something, you've got the skill to do it, but then the question is, do you have the opportunity? Well, you might have the opportunity, say you've got the skill and the passion to be a journalist, but say nobody will employ you to be a journalist and you can't even get on a computer to write your own blog. So no one's reading your journalism. Well, that means the gate's shut. You're not called to be a journalist. But say you've got the passion for it, the skill to do it, the opportunity to do it. The next question you've got to ask yourself is, does it contradict the Bible? You know, you might be, you're not, but you might be a, an absolutely stunning woman who loves to be an erotic dancer. There's, there, and you might have the opportunity to be an erotic dancer. Yeah. But there's absolutely no way you can square being an erotic dancer with being a Christian. So that's not your vocation, okay? You can do sort of Christian dance as a, an act of worship. That's historical, it's in the church, it's in the Bible. And maybe that's your calling. But like, you can't be an erotic dancer. And that's never going to be your calling. So say you've got the passion for it, the skill to do it, the opportunity to do it, and it doesn't contradict the Bible. The next question is, does it make you a better Christian? So what happens if you're called to be a soldier? Well, you can't be a, a Christian soldier in something like the British or the American <laughs> army. Why? Because those states are unchristian and they may call you to kill your brothers and sisters in Christ, which is the error that Russians are doing right now. They're literally killing their brothers and sisters in Christ because their foreign policy has not been discipled by their Christianity. They also don't recognise the Ukrainian church as being an authentic church. Exactly, which demonstrates so the point I'm making. Brothers and sisters. Uh, well, let, let's, not get, let's not get sidetracked. I'm just giving you how you can learn your discernment. So you've got to have the passion for it, the skill to do it, the opportunity to do it. It can't contradict the scripture. The, the fifth point is that it has to make you a better Christian. So I know a Christian who is, um, is a professional um, security guard and he uses his skill to defend Christian ministries who do on the edge of society kind of ministry. So he defends abortion, Christ, uh, Christians protesting against abortion. He defends Christians reaching out to prostitutes who are getting harassed by their pimps and he sticks up for them. He's defended Christians in this park. That's an example of it making you a better Christian, right? So it's got to make you a better Christian. The sixth thing you've got to ask yourself is what are your elders saying? Those who are in the faith, who love your discipleship in the Lord, who want to see you grow, are they encouraging you to pursue a particular vocation? The answer should be yes. If the answer is no, you, that gives you pause for thought to think about, is this what I should be doing? The next thing that you should think of is, are you receiving resistance from sin, the world and the devil? So if you're following in your vocation, you should receive resistance from the sin within you because it makes you challenge that sin within you. You should encounter resistance from the world or you should encounter resistance from the devil, i.e. the devil's agents like the Islamists. But don't we encounter resistance no matter where we are and what we do, even no. as a Christian? No. If you, if you are, if you, if you're following, yeah, but the thing is, if you're following Christ, you should meet resistance from one of these three sources. If you're not following Christ, you f meet resistance from the good or from other evils, lesser evils or greater evils, right? But as a Christian, you will meet resistance from sin, sin or the world or the devil 
because you're seeking to follow Christ you and that's an indicator that you're following your vocation. I know you say that good is a side of good and we should like distinguish ourselves from everything bad but what if Muslims for example are protesting against something that we agree with such as abortion, if they're protesting yeah. against abortion should we join them in that fight? Wouldn't that be a self or internal contradiction We shouldn't. Our beliefs? We shouldn't join Muslims in their fights but we should welcome Muslims who join us in ours. So if they're holding a demonstration for example against abortion would it be right for a Christian to join in with that pro protest? If the Christian had planned to have his own abortion protest that day, that place, yes. The point is, you, we, we as Christians need, this is where it's about solidarity and about having um, a sense of our own uh, community. We've got to stand on what we believe. The scriptures say that you shouldn't be unevenly yoked with the unbeliever, right? So that means that if the Muslims are doing something, right, we shouldn't join with them. We should join with ourselves in doing good. Even if it's a cause that we agree with. And if Muslims come and join us, we should welcome them because they are people of goodwill, because they are siding with the church in its fights. But the thing is, if you side with the Muslims in their fights, then what you do is you create emotional bindings to those Muslims that could be the path by which you lose your own faith and your, the scriptures teach us that A, we shouldn't be unevenly yoked with the unbeliever, but B, that you should guard your own heart because your heart is the wellspring of life. So you don't create connections and pathways that can lead you away from the faith. Would it be unequally yoked in terms of a relationship or unequally yoked in, ter in terms of like a friendship or a bonding? In terms of the context of that verse? So if a Muslim befriends you, if a Muslim befriends you and they accept your Christianity, yeah. They're not trying to pull you away from the church, right? Or they're an honest interlocutor, like they have an honest dialogue with you, yeah. right? You can be friends with that person because you're called to evangelize them, but you still must guard your heart. You mustn't because become so empathetic to the Muslim that you start to question your own faith because of the ways they see things, right? But if they are honest and open and you're having a dialogue, you can have a friendship with them. But if they're a Christophobe, like many of the Muslims in this park are Christophobes, they're enemies of the church, they, they call for the church to be persecuted, we shouldn't be making friends with these Muslims. We should be opposing these Muslims politically, the intellectually. Says. Yeah, the scriptures teach that you shouldn't even have fellowship with an unbeliever. So when we see church... Don't invite Muslims, them to your house. When we see churches inviting Muslims in to pray with us, that's us inviting them into our house of worship. Yes, Muslims should not be invited into the church to pray with us because when they pray they're not worshiping the same god Even and if, if they, they pray and if they pray to our god they're not muslims they're christians so if they pray to sorry just want to make sure shamsi's doing a runner oh is he running again so so shamsi's running typical shamsi Ta sh typical shamsi doing another runner right so my point to you is that when we invite muslims into the church Right? We should be firm in our faith. I can't stress this enough. Right? Can I, can I? Thank you so much. Let me show you one verse from the Bible. I think every man should stick this verse above his bed and read it every single day. Right? Every man in the church. Right? 1 Corinthians 16. In 1 Corinthians, and, and yes, bro, I do want to answer your question, but just let me finish with this guy. In 1 Corinthians 16, verse 13, it says, be on alert. So that means be aware. It's this idea of nepsis. Watch over your own soul. Watch what's happening around you. Stand firm in the faith. There you go. You have an apostolic instruction that you should be firm in the faith, that you have conviction, that you have commitment, that you have belief, right? Act like a man. What does it mean to act like a man? It means that you shoulder responsibility, you defend your community, you stand up for what is right and you stand up against what is evil. Shouldn't everyone do that? Every Christian should do that. Every Christian. So a Christian should be called to be a man? Every Christian, should, every Christian should do what the apostles teach us to do. The problem is we shouldn't universalize the teachings of our religion because you can quote this to a non-believer but they don't believe in this book. What does it mean by be like a man? Be, I've just, I just explained it to you. you shoulder you shoulder responsibility. responsibility without without crying. Is that being a man? Or is yes, being a that, that, that's being a, a Christian man. It's talking about being a man. It says act like a man. Shouldn't everyone do that? 
Um, every, everyone should do that, but we're talking about men. Just so, men? No, we're just talking about men. I'm not saying that women shouldn't act with responsibility, okay. but I'm saying that Christian men should act with responsibility. As well? Because the Bible is saying, act like a man, so you can't apply that to women, can you? But you said to act kind of, like a man is to have conviction and responsibility. But a man and a woman don't do the same thing. A, a woman can never be a father. A man can never be a mother. A, man ca a woman can't be a bishop of the church. A man can. But they can have a man, responsibilities. A man is physically stronger. We're not denying mm. that women have responsibilities. Yeah. But we're talking about acting like men. It's not talking about women. It's talking about men. So it's talking about men embodying all of their responsibilities. Their attributes. Right, the fullness of their manliness. So is this referring to Christians or just men in particular? It's talking church? only to Christians. Christians. Only to Christians. To Christian men. Corinthians is written only to Christians. It is talking only to Christians. We read it as only talking to Christians. I understand this only being talked to Christians, but is it talking to Christian men in particular? It's talking to Christian men in particular. Okay. Yes. I thought it was talking Are we all to clear about it? Well, but no, it's talking about men. It's talking about men, it's not talking to women because the responsibilities of men and the responsibilities of women are not the same. Mm. Men are physically stronger than women. So men should fight, yeah. women shouldn't be placed in a position where they have to fight. Yeah. And if they are, and unfortunately many of them are, there's many women who are having to do the responsibilities of men in the church because men aren't stepping up, right? And men need to step up. And it's wrong of the women to do so. No, it's not that they're forced to do it by the circumstance. Do they choose to do it? They're doing it because men are not stepping up. It is the fault of men for not being manly. So men should be manly and women shouldn't step up to be a man. But if they choose to step up to be a man, they can do so. It would, I, I would say it would be a lesser kind of sin. So it would be a kind of sin that, that is venial because of the circumstances. A sin for the woman? If a woman is behaving like a man or taking the office of a man, then yes, that would be a sin, but I wouldn't say it's a mortal sin that rejects them from the faith. So it'd be an issue of the it's the, same, it's the same as if a man takes on the demeanor of a woman mm. and doesn't take on the full embodiment of his masculine responsibilities. Right. He's also committing a sin, but it's not the kind of sin that would reject him from the faith. But why would it be considered a sin if they were put in that second Do you believe that there are men? I believe there are men, I believe there are women, but I don't understand do men, why it's do men, the will of God do men, for women to step up to be a man. Do men, do men have attributes that are unique to them. Just because they have attributes doesn't mean that women can't inherit those attributes. Can a woman be a father? Such as stepping up in the church, for example. Can a woman be a father? Such as stepping up in the church. Can a woman be a father? Can they be a father? No. They can't be a father. Right. I'm, I'm only asking this question so I can get a better understanding of the Bible. Yeah, not what, because I want to I know, I know, I know. <laughs> but what I'm trying to say to you is that when, when the scriptures talk about men, mm. we take men we take the idea of men seriously. Yeah. The, the scriptures didn't put men there because it didn't mean men. It meant act like a act man. Like men, be strong, let all that you do be done in love. So when it says be strong, that's strong in what? In the relationship? In right, so be strong. So be strong is in, in the fullness of your humanity yeah. as a man. In every area. In every area of your life, mm. which obviously includes your faith, mm. that you should be strong in your faith. So women can do certain things that men can do, and if they choose to do the things that men can do, would it be a sin for them to do so? Depends what it is. There are some things that both men and women can do. So if it was a man's fault to divorce the wife, for example, yep. would that be the sin of the woman to step up to be a man? In what, in what sense to be a man? In the regard of the divorce. To, in to what step sense? Up to take on the responsibilities of a father. Right, well. Which I think mothers can do. So, so that without, firstly, a, a mother can, can never be a father, but a mother can take on some of the responsibilities of being so a father. when it says be like a man, it's not saying you're born a father yeah. or you're born a man. So in, in context of the verse, if a woman decides to be like a man, decides to take on to themselves the father like way of looking after the children if the father divorces the wife... That is the fault of the man. Sin. That's the fault of the man. Would it still be the sin for the mother? In, in a very minor way, but it's a, a, a... Why would it still be a sin for the mother? Because you've got to understand something about the way that I understand sin. I, I so like the sin. way that I understand sin is a very Augustinian way, which means that literally everything that we do is in some way a sin. Even if it means to stand up for the sake of the children? So, Would that so, be against so, the will of God? Because, no, because you've got to understand what I understand by sin. It's, it's like a, an, an ideal, it's a perfection. And nearly everything that we do will fall short of that perfection. So you can sin based on someone else's actions? What does sin mean? 
diverting away from the will of God. No, sin means falling short of the glory short of God. Short of the glory of God. Right. Which Can, everybody does. Which everybody does in every possible way. But if something happens not based on your own works or your own actions, can that be a sin? So, it, you, again, as far as I'm concerned... You're concerned. Nearly, this is a personal opinion. Is that a biblical view? It's a personal opinion based on what I think the Bible teaches. But can you understand it's my not, perspective also? It's, it's not unchallengeable. I'm, it, of course, it, I'm open to being challenged about it, but it's a very Augustinian way that I understand sin. I wouldn't consider myself challenging. So, I'm just like so, to get so what, what, what I'm trying mean? to say is, and I'm trying to explain it to you, sin literally means falling short of the mark. Right. The mark is to be like God. Yes. There's no way we are like God. Jesus does say to what, be like him in Exactly. So we, agree with that. so we fall short of the glory of God in every imaginable way but and there are only things imaginable in place from way. Doing so. so let me explain, because I'm literally answering your question. You're saying in every imaginable way? Yes, I'm saying, based on okay, let me, let, me, let me put this in categorical terms so you don't need to ask any more questions about this point. Mm. Absolutely everything you do yes. is a sin. Everything. Everything. Talking. Talk, you, the way you talk, the way you, the way you see, the way you perceive, the way you walk. Absolutely everything you do falls short of the glory of God because you could always do it in a more perfect way. What a load of mumbo right? That's very right. Thomistic. That is very Thomistic. But my point to you is, right, <laughs> now I'm used, to be clear, to be yeah. clear, I'm using hyperbole so there. So that's not a, not, not a united let, or let, let a, me, a universal uh, view of the Christian No, of course it sin. isn't. This okay. is a very okay. personal Thomistic Augustinian way. You're quite open right? with that as well. Yeah, I'm quite open yeah. with that. Right, I'm not saying it is beyond rebuke. I'm not saying that it is unchallengeable. Yeah. I'm saying that's how I see it. But I'm using, I'm actually using hyperbole there. Because obviously the way you walk is not a sin, the way you breathe is not a sin, the way you see with your yeah. eyes is not a sin. I'm using <laughs> hyperbole so you don't need to ask for any more clarification. And you did make it clear that it's your own personal view. And I did say that and I have repeated that in ad nauseum so ad -nauseum. I will not repeat that again. But I, yeah, okay, fair okay? Fair enough. So my, my point to you is, right, that that that's how I understand sin. Yeah. Now, the vast majority of our sins unquestionably are dealt with immediately by Christ's death on the cross, right? Of the mortal sin, but in terms right. of the birth and, being and a Because man. the vast majority of our sins are what we would call venial sins. Okay. And in other words, if we use the analogy of sin to our relation as walking towards God, a venial sin is when you trip, but you keep walking in the same direction. A mortal sin is when you actually turn your back on God and you start walking in the wrong direction. When we create, when we do a mortal sin, i.e. we turn our back on God, yes. it's important that we confess that sin to one another. And we confess it to one another so that that sin can be challenged within our own soul. But you don't need to confess the tiniest little thing that you do wrong, right? Are all sins addressed by God? I want to come back to this verse. But are all sins can, like, addressed by God on Judgment Day? All sins are addressed by God on Judgment so Day. So the sins in which you consider not mortal or which you would refer to as trivial sins, would there be addressed by God on Judgment Day? Well, they're actually addressed by Christ on Calvary. All, sins, Calvary. all sins are addressed by Christ on Calvary. Right. Christ addresses all, all sins. sins. And if you haven't repented for the minorest of sins? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. The minorest of sins don't even need repentance. Would that be justice if right. the sin isn't dealt with? The, the sin is dealt with by Christ. It is dealt with by Christ. Christ, the, 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 oh. every sin is dealt with by Christ I, for one, on Calvary. I don't acknowledge a woman if a man divorces her and sets up having the role as a father to look after their children as a sin. Great, that's fine. You so can if have I don't that opinion. Repent for that. Would I be damned, for example? I'm not. I'm not going to pass judgment on you, bro. But you. You have from to your, work this from out. My own perspective. My own perspective is that th this would be a very minor dispute between me and you, and that that whoever is right and whoever is wrong, and it could be that we're both wrong. Mm. Neither of us need to worry because the sin with is dealt with on Calvary. If remember, but remember, remember, Christian, remember. Christian. remember the, the scriptures teach that love covers a multitude of sins. Mr. Speaker. And the reality, no, I'm sorry, I'm having a conversation. So in, in terms of the love that we have, that love is far greater than these minor differences. Now, coming back to this point, that you don't agree with the way that I've laid it out, it's absolutely fine. I am not committed to my own perspective to the degree that I would die for it. Yeah. My level of certainty of this position is less than 50%. And if someone could give me really good arguments to abandon it, I would do, because it's a very minor perspective on a particular nuanced understanding. And it's also a minor perspective in terms of Christians as well. I've never but heard I, a Christian I, say that before. I, 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 no, Thomas, Thomas of Aquinas said it. 
Is that the perspective uh, you got it from? You got it from him? Thomas Aquinas said it and Augustine said it. I actually got it directly from Augustine. I got it from Augustine, yeah. I, I, this is my understanding of Augustine. Now, I might be wrong Your in my understanding. Of him. My understanding of Augustine, correct. So, Christians could have perceived that differently, so it is a minority perspective. It, it, possibly it's a minority perspective, or you were aware of a survey that demonstrates it's a minority I'm perspective. I'm not saying it is or it isn't, I'm asking you a question. I'm saying it could be. It could be. Yeah. So, now, coming back to this passage, because this is the one that I want to talk about, okay. right? Because hopefully now we've, we've laid out and you understand what I'm saying. I'm in a way confused in my own perspective, but the fact that you yourself has just said your own perspective to yeah, me. Yeah, it's my perspective. I can't consider that fact. That's I fine. I can't consider that truth. That's fine. But coming back to this verse, when it says, act like men, mm. it's talking to men. Mm. It's obviously talking to men because it ad identifies its subject. So it's talking to you and it's talking to me. Mm that we should embody the fullness of our humanity as men okay. with all that is particular to manliness mm. and that means things like a list in the Bible is never a comprehensive list it's always a sample list so I use lists in the same way being a man means shouldering responsibility without squirming it means defending your community, your family, the church it means standing up for what is right and opposing what is evil but see, These still, are four examples of what it means to be a man. Because women can also do those things. Can men do those things? Men can do those things. Great. Also can women. Th those things, right, you make your own list then of what it means to act like a man. And that's what the Bible is saying. Okay. You make your own list. Your interpretation of what the Bible you, is you, saying. You make your own list. Brother, let's not get caught up I'm on this. I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm not saying you're right. Bro, I'm saying to you, what I'm saying to you, bro, is you don't like my list. I'm not Go, saying I don't like it, I'm just listen, saying I like more evidence for Bro, it. let me finish a sentence. I'm not saying you're wrong. Let me finish a sentence. Don't mischaracterise my words. Can, can, I haven't. Can I finish a sentence? I'm not saying you're wrong. I never said you did. Okay. I didn't say you did. I'm saying if you don't like my list, you go away and think about what it is to be uniquely manly. You create your own list and you interpret it right there. It says here, be right? like men, be strong. Yes. And right? you gave your interpretation of what it means to be strong. Yes, and let me explain something to you, right? The scriptures teach us that we should work out our salvation with fear and trembling. So you need to work it out and I need to work it out as Christian men. We don't have to agree on every single detail of what that means. That's why I believe the right? whole ecumenical concept, which yeah. I don't agree or disagree with. Again, I'm trying to find out myself the truth. Yeah, and, I, and I'm telling you my perspective. But I don't find this minor. And I'm, I'm telling you my perspective. So if you don't like my list, you go make your own list and you live by that. Okay? If it's the wrong list well, that it I'm living by. It would depend. You, that, the, yes, so if you... And then what you do is, as Christians, <laughs> you create your list, I create my list, and if we find that our list... You're contra an evangelist. I go to you for assistance, for example, if, I, if I'm in confusion. Right, and what I'm saying to you is the way discipleship works, right, apart from certain core issues that we all as Christians have to agree on, like Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again, yep, right? The Trinity, the Trinity me, I'm right? But Christian what we must do company. as Christians is when we, we get to discipleship, each of us must work out as a group, within the group, what it means to follow Christ in our lives. Mm. Let me finish. I just got uh, right. And when and when we and when we and when we disagree about something like we have here, mm. right? What we need to do is to sit it out and discuss it. And we may come to an understanding that we both agree upon, mm. or we may not. Mm. And if we don't, then we need to ask ourselves: Is this something that means that I have to reject you as a Christian, or you have to reject me as a Christian? I definitely don't reject you as a Christian. That's fine. I never said that you did. It's just that I thought you believed that I was wrong in what I believed in. No, what I, what I said well, is... You thought that I thought you were wrong, which I don't believe whatsoever. Well, and then, and then, and then I never why I'd watch you so I get a better perspective and, of your understanding. And I never said any of those things. The Bible. And I never said any of those things. I never said... Thanks for clarifying. I never said that you think that I wasn't a Christian and I never said that you weren't a Christian. Okay. All I said was that this scripture is talking to men. <laughs> which I think your interpretation of that verse is incorrect. Right, fine. That's fine. But if your interpretation of correct is correct, it's still talking to men as part of a group. But then to consider women as One who second. do inherit those attributes as being sinful for doing so... Uh, is, is, is now not the point. But if they did, then I wouldn't find that uh, that's what I disagree that's with. That's fine, you can. But that's not the point. Because if you believe, let's take your interpretation, yep. that the word here includes women as well, yep. right? Does it also include men? It says men, it doesn't say women. Right, so if it also includes men, that, that change, I'm... That would change the verse. That, that, that I, if, that if it also includes men, hmm. 
then that means that I'm talking into that part of the meaning of the verse. Okay. okay? So I'm not having any discussion about women. I'm talking about men. But that's why I disagree. That's it's fine. I'm not interested. You have that disagreement, bro. That's fine. Yeah. But in the bit that I'm talking to you about, yeah. because I'm a man yeah. and you're a man, and we're talking about a verse that either is directly only to men or talking about a verse that includes men, yeah. I want to have the discussion about the man bit. Okay. Thank you. But for, but Poor women, flipping it, bro. If women wasn't there, <laughs> would it make it any difference? <laughs> I, I understand your perspective. Oh my gosh. No, that's where we, Brother. That's where we go. Look for I, I think where we go is, I disagree with his perspective, yeah. but it does say men in the verse. Right. Okay. Does it include men in the verse? It does. It let's talk says, about that bit. It only says men in the verse. So let's talk about the man bit. But if it said women, would, it, would you disagree with the verse? I am not interested in that question. I want to talk about the man bit. Oh, but because even if there was a woman, would it bro, be a problem? Bro, 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 no, bro. Don't up the R. Don't bro, up the R. Yeah. Bro, I'm the, listening to the you. reason it's why. St. John of Arc. <laughs> right. St. John of Arc. Okay. She was a woman who took on a masculine role. Yeah. She is a saint of the church. Yeah. Yes. That's why I don't consider it a sin. And I'm. That's what I was trying to say. Bro, bro. That's evidence of what bro, I said. Bro, bro. And I'm, and I'm happy for you to have that position. I don't even think it's worth debating about. Okay. If you don't find it debate worth debating about, we don't I don't. It. I don't think it's debatable about because I think it's about a red herring to the point that I was trying to make originally. And the point that I was trying to make originally is how this verse applies to you, because you are a man. And appealing to the audience, which is at the beginning. Can I right. Make an so I'm also talking about men. You're entitled to your opinion on that verse. I'm not saying it's wrong. I and I'm truth. not. And I'm not saying that you think that I am wrong. What I'm trying to say is, in terms of the point that I was trying to make, it's actually irrelevant. Because if your interpretation is correct, then this still includes men. Does include men. And if my interpretation of this verse is correct, it's only talking about but men. But even for the sake of the audience, so the if bit, we have women. So the bit that the where it the bit where it overlaps is the man bit. And since one man is speaking to another man, that's the bit I want to talk about. The man bit. Right? For the sake of you moving have, on, for the sake of moving on, yes. You have your opinion about the women, I, I'm not interested. You have that opinion, I'm not saying it's wrong. Uh, okay. And on another day, at another time... We could sit down and have the conversation. We could have a conversation and about it. And see for ourselves what is the truth. But I want to I wanna zoom in. I wanna, the first thing, the, the thing that I would say about our understanding of truth is that we don't have to have an understanding of truth that is exclusionary in the minor details. Would that be minor? It is quite, yes. It would be, it's quite possible for both me and you to be wrong in how we've read this verse and still be Christians. It is possible for you to be right and for me to be wrong and for us both to be Christians. And it is possible for me to be right and for you to be wrong and for us both to be Christians. <coughs> but then doesn't, doesn't Don't get down... caught up on minor points. Don't make mountains out of molehills. But doesn't it then come down to, is it right that we go to what salvation through works or belief, for example? If you believe in something that's incorrect, then those that believe it's belief would consider those... Yeah, but it's a question about whether the thing that you disagree about is a salvation issue. Is that a salvation issue? No. If you sin and you're saying, Ooh, or there can be sins that, are, that don't have to be forgiven. Or the scriptures, the forgiven. scriptures teach that there are sins that don't lead to death. Love can, yeah, love can cover a multitude of sins. No, that isn't even the verse I'm thinking of. Let me show you in John. Oh, right. So in John, it says I might need to pull it up. Bear with us one second. But the point is, bro. What I wanted to talk about, what the, the, the thing that I wanted to show you, was that. Could you Google what time are we on? Uh, it's ten past four. Ten past four. All right. So I've. I've got to go at 4.50 no matter what. 15? 4.50. 15. I right. have to go soon because my friend is waiting for me. Right. I wanted to burst this open at the seams, but you won't let me. A very interesting argument I've got here. Okay. Well, wait, no. If you want to have that conversation, <laughs> you go and have it with him like somewhere else. I'm very much to the point. I discovered I was homosexual 70 years ago. I'm not going to get sidetracked. I want to have oh, our not conversation. Go into that, is he? Right. So. God made me that way. I'm not saying you're right or wrong either. I think you can I, believe in what you want to believe in. He can believe in what he wants to believe. I, I can believe in what God, I want to believe in. God created me that way. Right. Truth. So if you get your Bible, get out your Bible. If you got it. Have you got your Bible? Uh, not on me at the moment. All right. So 1 John 5, 16 and 17. Let's what go there. NASB. 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 Right. The scholar's version. Okay. 
So the reason why I was getting frustrated, bro, is because I was trying to make one point and I feel we've just gone down a rabbit hole I on what think I think is an extremely minor point. It's just that I, I've i always had a whole fascination of what is true and what isn't. Right, that's and fine. And so when I believe that there's like, not a red flag in the sense, right. but if I believe that something's not con contradictory so, in the sense of what so, I believe myself. So one, one, five, 16 and 17. One, one, five, 16 and 17, right? Okay. So in 1, 5, 16 and 17, it says, if anyone sees his brother committing a sin, yep. not leading to death, he shall ask God, and God will for him give life to those who commit sin, not leading to death. All right? There is a sin leading to death. I do not say that he should make request for this. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not leading to death. What are the wages of sin? Death. Death. So the scriptures <coughs> is making a distinction between the sins that lead to death, i.e. turning away from God, and the sins that don't lead to death, i.e. sins that you make in your direction towards God, i.e. You fall short of the glory of God whilst trying to embody the glory of God. But how would you say that verse is linked to that verse and that that verse is not saying that if the woman decides to be or act like a father or a man, therefore it's not leading to death? So what, what I would say is we, we, would, we would need to identify what is the core issues of Christianity. The core issues of Christianity of, are about who we say Jesus is and what we say Jesus has done. Okay, and we take everything that the Bible says, we don't pick and choose verses, we don't ignore verses, we hold all the verses in balance when they all talk about the same subject. So, the scriptures are clear, all sin, that the, 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 the wages of sin is death. But it, the scriptures is also clear that not all sin leads to death. And the scriptures are clear in saying that sin is to fall short of the glory of God. Because Christ says that you shall be, you shall be like your Father in heaven, be holy like your father in heaven is holy now we fail in that even when we embody good christian practice we could always worship better we could always speak better i sinned today in my conversation with you because i got frustrated by this red herring but i'm not worried that's uh, but, but, you interpret it that way i think I, I do i see it as a red like herring. yourself I, I see it as a red herring. i see it as a red herring. And i also did notice something as well like i watched your videos i think quite a lot yeah. of what you do has taught me so much in my own yeah. discipleship and what i do myself and my evangelism yeah but my intention here is obviously to establish truth, and, but the one thing I did notice right now is just, I, you asked me, what is sin? I said, falling short for the glory of God. You yeah. said to me, no. No, I and did. No, if I said that, then, then allow me to correct it because that would have been a slip of the tongue. Sin is falling short of the glory of God. That is what I said at the time. Right, right. right. And, but falling short of the glory of God, there, there are two ways that you can fall short of your glory there, of God. There can be, but it's just when I said it and you, you said can, no, that's when I that, 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 put myself away from your perspective. That, that, that's fine. Then I misheard you. Yourself, yeah, then I, I misheard you. Which is fair. So, so I, I misheard you because I, I don't remember you saying that, but that's fine. That I happens. I believe you. I believe you. I believe you. I believe you. So there's two ways that you can fall short of the glory of God. You can try to aim at the glory of God and miss, or you can decide that the glory of God is not worth aiming at. If you decide that w not the glory of God is not worth aiming at, your sins are mortal. Like, you will die in that sin. But if you aim at the glory of God, you will obviously miss because God is perfect and you are not. Yep. And Christ has redeemed you of your sin. Yep. So that's what I meant that when I've got, I've got a Thomistic Augustinian understanding of sin, is that <laughs> virtually everything that we do is sin. Yep. But you don't need to worry about it because Christ has redeemed you from your sin. I do believe he's redeemed us, but I don't think our sin can be unchecked. But right. I, have, I have so many questions, but my friend is waiting for me. Right, can I come back to 1 Corinthians 16, verse 13 and finish then? Yeah. Because we have agreed that by some interpretation, this is talking about men, mm. which means it's talking to you, mm. right? And it calls you to be strong, yeah. right? To be strong means that we aren't pushed around, mm. A bit like this conversation. You haven't been pushed around. You've you've stood your ground. Neither have you. Yeah, exactly, exactly, and that's I mean, you've good. Had the experience, so. And that's good. I'm celebrating that. But it means in every sense. It also means physically we should be strong. It means mentally we should be strong. Emotionally we should be strong. You know. But anyone who's studied strength knows that the best strengths are the ones that bend. 
The towers that can withstand an earthquake are the ones that shake. The swords that can withstand a battle without breaking are the ones that bend. Yeah. So there has to be emotional flexibility in our strength. And this is what it means to be strong. Now you can disagree with that and have a different understanding of strong. And we can argue about which one it is. And then through argument, we can come to an understanding of which understanding of strength is better. Right? I'm not saying that interpretation. I'm not saying you are. I just think if women are the same I, way. I am not saying not you, I'm not saying you are, but okay. what I'm trying to say in, for this conversation, I'm not interested in that digression. I'm talking I'm not interested in that digression because I'm talking to a man about being a man and that's what I want to talk about. Now, we can have the conversation about women another day. And you're entitled to disagree with me. Okay. Right. Right? Now, it, then it says, let all that you do be done in love. So even when we are fighting, we must do it in love. Like we're not being motivated from a place of revenge. We're not being provoked. Pro we're not acting from a place of wrath and anger. We're not acting from a place of hatred. That even when we're fighting against the Islamists, no. we're fighting them because we want to protect them from the evil that they've been consumed by. So we disempower them, we take away their power to harm other people, and we do that because by doing that we stop them compounding their sin. Bob, I would like to continue this conversation, but my friend is waiting for me. Okay. We could discuss this another day. Yeah, it was lovely to talk with you, bro. you, bro. Lovely to talk. Come back and talk with us again. Definitely. Right? Right? And if you want to come back and have that conversation about men and women, we can. But honestly, it wasn't the point I was trying to get into. I understand that, but yeah. I do think it's quite important personally. Well, I, I think in relative value, it's not <laughs> of the same kind of value the that... The salvation of both people, I think, is important too. And I, 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 no one brought into question the salvation of women in this when conversation. When it comes down to sin, sinfulness and the women taking on themselves the men's attributes, I think, in the way it does in my perspective... Not all sin leads to death, bro. Based on your interpretation of what death is. Bro, both of us, as far as I'm concerned, in this conversation, both of us sinned. But neither of us are going to go to hell for it. If you repent for it. No, Christ has saved you from your sins. Um, from, from this, it's can the you, mortal you, sin you, that leads to death. Can you sin and not repent? There are sins that you do that you're not even conscious of. But is the sin of a woman taking on themselves the attributes of a man a sin? I wouldn't say, I would say it's a venial sin. A venial sin. Venial sin. And that's a sin that, in your perspective, does not lead to death? Yes. And that's, the, you got from Augustine, your interpretation of Augustine? It is my interpretation of Augustine and you're free to disagree it's with me. It's a minority view. No, you don't know it's a minority view unless you've got some research to prove it's a minority view. So the doctrine of the church is that venial sins do not lead to death. Which church? Well, the Catholic Church. The historical I'm church. Not, I'm not saying it's the wrong church. I'm, I'm, I'm just as ecumenical as you, perhaps. Yeah, I know, I know. It's just about establishing truth. I know, but the point is not... The point is there are different... Or clearly, there's only one truth. To the question that we're debating about, there's obviously only one right answer, right? But what I'm saying is, for me, the answer to that particular question is not the kind of question that Christians need to fall out about. I know you're not, and I'm not saying you are. But that means if it's not something that we have to fall out about or anathematize one another about, it's not a salvation question. The kind of questions that Christians need to anathematize one another about are questions connected to salvation and that is entirely what about... I could consider is linked to salvation because I hold a different perspective. Right, well, then, then, then if you follow your logic through, you need to anathematize me. Anathematize you? Yeah, you need to say I'm not oh, part I of the church. You. Right, but, I don't consider you a heretic. Right, do you consider what I've said to be... Do you consider what I've said to, call in, to, to, to cause people to lose their salvation? No, because I don't know what the truth is. Right, so in that case then, we don't anathematize. I'm not saying you're a heretic. I never said you were. You're not a non-Trinitarian. I never, I never, exactly. So you've identified a core principle there that is, it, it is a salvation question. But our interpretation of that words act like a man. Let me finish. I, I don't know the truth, Let I'm me finish, bro. Let me finish, bro. Please. That, that interpretation of the words act like a man, that is not a salvation issue. Like you, well, it, it, you. It, it, it is not a salvation issue. No one's salvation. Your salvation is not going to be lost because you interpret depends that verse you, differently to me. Your interpretation of sin. And if you believe that sins must be repented for in order to go into heaven. All sins, right? When a Christian repents, they repent of all their sins. All their sins. Yes, so they you do. That's included in all their sins. Right, but the point is, bro, 
It isn't that you have to repent for every single sin that you, you, that you, you, you do. But what if you commit it not knowing that it's a sin? That's my point, is that you sin all the time without knowing it's a sin. I sin all the time without knowing that it's Once a sin. Once you've had this conversation, and I don't know whether or not it's a sin, knowing that it could be a sin, and I commit that sin, then we're but this is, But this is the why, brother, we have confidence in Christ's teachings that he died for our sins. I do believe that. And when, and, when we, and when we receive baptism, when we've repented, when we have begin that process of metanoia, that lifestyle of repentance, even the sins that you are not aware of, so long as they're minor, right? Because you've got to understand what a major sin is from a minor sin. A major sin is that you know what you're doing, it's concerned with some actual serious thing, and you do it willfully without compulsion. Well, if you willfully look after your children, for example, and if you willfully uh, choose knowing that there's an issue around whether or not you believe it's true to sin based on if you're acting like a man, as a woman, then I would say that you acknowledging that something could be sinful and you're committing that sin. But I'm saying to you that in a world that is full of sin, full of divorce, full of men, being cowards and not looking after their families and putting women in awful positions where they have to be both mother and father, it is impossible to get through a world like that without sinning. I accept that and the Bible does talk a lot about the end of times and what times are like, but you say to always strive to perfection. Yes. And how can you strive to perfection knowing that you have to make these... Well, the, 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 but the reality is... I, I really and, do have to and what I'm And what I'm trying to say to you, bro, and what I'm trying to say to you, bro, and what I'm trying to say to you, bro, is that, that a woman that finds themselves in that awful position doesn't have to worry because Christ has redeemed them of their sin. The greater sin falls on the man that did not act like a man and abandoned his family. He's the one that needs to repent and confess his sin. And if he repents and confesses his sin, he returns to his wife and he looks after her. Yeah. Unless the wife, the the man, yeah, not unless, the wife. unless the wife then rejects him and says, you can't come back. In which case, the woman then has something to confess and repent of. So the woman would have to confess. If, she, if the man is repenting and saying, look, I, I was wrong to abandon you. I was wrong to divorce you. It still isn't the woman's fault. I'm literally going to finish my sentence. If the man says, comes back to the wife and says, I was wrong to divorce you, I was wrong to abandon you, I want to return to you, I want to re-establish our marriage legally, and I want to take up my responsibilities as a father, because the way that I treat you was wrong in divorcing you and abandoning you, but then the woman turns around and says, no, you can't. The problem now is with the woman, not with the man. Would, and that would be the sin of the woman. What? That would be the sin of the woman. Then, then that would be the mortal sin of the woman. Because she's now the one rejecting the family. But what if she didn't see any sincerity in his repentance? Well, then obviously it changes the understanding of the sin. If she thinks that he's lying for some, some duplicitous motive and she's trying to protect her children, then she's still committing a sin, but I wouldn't see it as a venial sin. Remember something, this is important to this entire conversation. God knows the truth of every situation. God knows the reality of every situation and he will judge judiciously and righteously in every way, factoring in every conceivable circumstance, both that we can imagine and we can't imagine, and his judgment will be just. Me and you having this conversation are like two people fumbling around a law textbook and we've only and we're on day one of studying law. Right? Our our hypothetical situations are all in and of themselves imperfect and in and of themselves grasping at the, the, the full pureness of God's judgment. So we shouldn't fear that God's going to make a bad judgment even if our examples are themselves bad because they don't really capture the fullness of a situation. Right. Okay. I'm not going to disagree with you. But I know I'm you saying, don't. I'm just saying that 
You why speak. Still be I love the way you speak with why, passion why and like. Be, I do be, love it. Listen, why would it still be considered a sin if God, through a judicial perspective, don't doesn't see it as something that was uh, ultimately bad on the side of the woman? Ultimately, bro. Ultimately, bro. All of our conversation is hypothetical. I am not the judge of anyone. Christ alone will judge, and his apostles will judge over Israel according to the to Christ's judgment. They will embody his judgment over Israel. So it, our perfection in synergy is only where we, where, where we embody what God is doing, right? So our conversation is all hypothetical. Judgment is to God, right? That's who will be the ultimate judge and where, we, and where the apostles synergize with that judgment. And they will do perfectly. Christ has promised that, right? My point to you is that that, that's, that's something that we have to assent to and believe, yep. right? So that means that any criticism of my argument is only a criticism of my example because of the many sins of my example in that it does not truly reflect the glory of God, yes. right? However, I am not worried that my example uh, is going to condemn me to hell because I, so. because I am not... I am not ultimately, I, I, I've qualified it all properly in the sense of all judgment is in the hands of a perfect judge. Yeah. But also, all I'm trying to express to you, I'm, ex I'm expressing a couple of things. One, I'm expressing that I think that that verse is speaking about men, not women. It is talking to men. Right? And, and even if a woman does those things, you bro, can't Bro, it bro, bro, bro. Like, I'm just recapitulating. All I'm trying to express to you is that verse is speaking to men. And in, even in your interpretation, we have an overlap. We both agree it's speaking to men. The second point that I'm trying to make to you is not every sin has the same weight. That not every sin leads to death. There are some sins that lead to death and there are some sins that don't lead to death. And thirdly, I'm saying that Christ is our saviour. And that if we cling to the cross and we repent of our mortal sin, then we do not need to worry if we repent of our sin, I, I, we I do what, not I need to worry. Saying, but again, the fact that you don't find trivial sin something to be repented for. I said it's called venial sin. Venial sin. And I showed you in scripture where the apostle himself teaches that not every sin leads to but death. But then you have to value out what is a venial sin. Exactly. And then you showed me a and way I you give, can consider that. And I did give you three qualifications. Qualifications based on. Well, I gave you three qualifications for what is a mortal sin. One, it's got to be something actually serious. Stealing a loaf of bread from a rich housemate, right, is a sin. Yes. But it is not a sin that's going to send you to hell. If you don't have bread and you stole a loaf of bread, it's still wrong, I'm not saying you should do it, but I'm saying it is a venial sin. Two, so it's gotta be about a serious matter. Two, you've got to do it freely, understanding what you're doing. So in other words, if you're a man who commits adultery on your wife and you're a Christian, and you know adultery is a sin, and you willfully commit adultery, you've committed a mortal I sin. I did give a counter response to that. And, and I said, thirdly, what if someone and else thirdly, influences your sin? And thirdly, or influences you to and sin? This is why or you someone else's sin? And this is why you needed to listen to the third criteria. Because the third criteria that I gave you is that you do it freely without compulsion. In other words, you are not compelled by poverty to steal. You're not compelled at gunpoint to recant. You're not compelled by... Um, you know, someone beating you into doing a particular action. You're doing it freely. Those are the things that make your sin mortal sins. But why would sins. it be a sin in the first place? Why would it be a sin? Why would it be a sin in the first place? If you do something for, for in full knowledge in, that's serious that's if it's a mortal sin. and without... If it's a mortal sin? Yes. Why should it be considered a sin in any way possible if it wasn't your fault? Right. The, 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 reason, the, the, reason, the reason why it's a sin even if it's not your fault. Yeah. Remember, I'm coming from a hardline, Thomistic, Augustinian position, mm. right? Not every Christian agrees with that, but some do. And we don't know who's in the majority because unless you've got the survey to prove it, we don't know. Now, in terms of that statement, the world itself is sinful. Mm. The systems we live by, the laws we live under, the society we live in is sinful. People who live in the third world and the second world and corrupt societies like Colombia will understand this far better than English people who think we live in a, a, a good society. <coughs> but the reality is we live in a sinful world 
and that's, that society itself falls short of the glory of God. And when we move in that society, we also fall short of the glory of God. So you can't strive to be a perfect Christian in a sinful society? No, you do strive to be a perfect Christian in a sinful society, but you do so with the full knowledge you're not going to achieve it. So the fact that you know you're not going to achieve it... Does not you excuse you, try, you, you try from trying. So, you try to do so without sinning. You try to do so without sinning, but you will ultimately sin. Obviously, that's inevitable. Yes. But if someone else sins, and then you're getting the accountability or the backlash from it, then why should that be... No, hold on. If someone has is committing a sin, yes. right, the, it depends upon their direction. No. If you've rejected what God, kind of like towards God or away from God, the Islamists in this park have set their face against God. Yes. Well, they have what hardened, they believe our God is. They, they have hardened their heart against God. Mm. Right? They need to repent of their sins because they are going to burn because they have made themselves the enemies of God's church. But what if they don't consider themselves as being Does enemies not matter. God? It does not matter what they consider themselves. It matters what God considers them. Well, that's because why I have God a is the one. With your interpretation. Then you, you're fine, bro. Not, not a problem as such that you're wrong, but a problem that I don't know if it's true or not. That's fine. So you go away, but you they think don't about know it. If it's true or not. So how no, they be... no, bro. The, the, the Islamists in this park have had the Christian faith explained to them in ad nauseum. But even an average Muslim that uh, doesn't but, believe in no, God. Hold on. We're talking about the example of the Islamists in this park. Just the Islamists? Yes, that is the example that I gave. That is the example that I'm talking about. Could there be no. an Islamist in this park? Can I, finish, can I finish about my example? Yeah. Right, so the Islamists in this park, right, they have set their face against God. They know very well that we Christians believe in one God. They lie when we believe in three gods. So they are lib deliberately setting their mind and their heart against God with the same firmness and conviction that you should set your mind and your heart towards God. Okay, that's the reality. They are guilty in their sin because they know the truth and they have willfully rejected it. I would never stand here now and let's defend come. an Islamist over a Christian, for example. Good. But if the Islamist, who is new to the park, yep. doesn't know much about the Christian perspective yeah. and goes by primarily based on their own perspective yes. of what they know from like Saudi Arabia, for example, they come yeah. over here temporarily just to see what it's like. Someone who's ignorant. After knowing, like watching EF Dawah on the yeah, channel, yeah, 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 for yeah. example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they speak to a Christian and they're so confused the Trinity and Christian yeah. because of their own religion. Yeah. Would that be a sin? So, yes. But it would, that would be a sin. It would be a sin, but would it be a mortal sin? The thing that... It would be a mortal sin. That their, their misunderstanding... Again, remember, all final judgments are to God. Lord. We're just speaking hypothetically, like two law students who are on day one of studying law. Mm. Right? So remember, I'm not trying to speak for God. I'm just trying to work this issue out with you from my perspective, mm. right, to explain my perspective. So would their confusion be a mortal sin? No, it's obviously not. Someone's not committing a mortal sin by being confused. But when they proclaim as the God of Israel, Allah, who is not known to Israel, mm. they're committing a mortal sin in that proclamation. Even if they don't know themselves that he's not the God of Israel? If they have no exposure to the truth, obviously they're not culpable for their ignorance. And that won't be a mortal sin? That wouldn't be a mortal sin. But they'll be judged then by what knowledge they do have mm. and what they do believe. That's fair. Right, but if they judge truthfully, according to truth, they would have to reject Muhammad because anyone who studied Muhammad's life as any Muslim would, mm. would know <laughs> from an honest understanding of the history yes. that that is not a God of the, that's not a prophet of the God of Israel. Again, I'm not defending Islamists, I'm not defending Muslims. I know you I would in any day defend a Christian over a Muslim and I would always fight in a crusade, for example, if there was like a, a war between Christians. Thanks and be to God. Uh, but, however, but from the perspective of the Muslims or the Islamists, if they do come here saying that they, for example, believe that Allah is of Israel or yep. he is the God of Israel yep. and that Allah is, for yep. example, I don't know, the God of the Christians and the Jews yeah. and they've been told that their entire life yep. and the history of Muhammad yep. um, and the life of Muhammad is their moral standard and they've been taught that from when they were born yep. and you're saying to them they're going to burn in hell for believing that. Yep. I don't find it logical that they'll just turn away from that and believe that the Christianity No, they wouldn't, true. they wouldn't, they wouldn't, I'm not, and, and I agree with you, that is not logical. And that wouldn't be a mortal sin. So, so let me, let me be clear. The thing is, everyone is going to be judged by truth and everyone has a moral responsibility to pursue truth. Mm. So that means 
that e even a Muslim who say never meets a Christian in their life, mm. right? So they never meet a Christian, right? They're obviously not culpable for what they don't know, mm. right? But what they can discern from what they know about their own religion is that obviously Muhammad is not a prophet known to Israel who and he didn't bring the same God as Israel and the reason why they would know that is because even just by reading Islamic literature they could see that the Jews and the Christians believe something different to Muhammad but if they don't know the scriptures from the Jews and the Christians no, but they can discern this from just study and just every whilst and they're being told that the Jews and the Christian scriptures every, are every person prophets. every yes they can still discern this because if they do a proper study what they will realize is that the Quran affirms that there is an Injil in the seventh century yes. and then they would just go away and they would look at okay what documents do we have from the seventh century <laughs> that are the Gospels and then they would see that we have documents from the seventh century that match our scripture I see how they can do it even a Muslim who never speaks to a Christian can still find the truth if they are committed to finding the truth I see how and they, they never need to read a Bible and they never need to speak to a Christian to do that they just need to be honest in an objective study of history and then compare that objective study of history with what their own books say I see how they can do that but if they haven't done that research would it still be a mortal sin again in, in terms I'm not claiming to be God yes. God will judge them what I am saying is that the fact that they had the opportunity to discover truth and they didn't discover truth, they rejected it, means they have committed a mortal sin. Would it sin. meet up to those three standards that you gave? That they did it consciously, consciously willingly, willingly, and without compulsion. Yes. So I would say yes. So in your perspective, because they haven't done the research upon themselves, they'd be committing a mortal sin? If they, if they, every human person has a moral obligation to pursue truth. What if they haven't been told that? You have a moral obligation. It's not actually, you don't need to be because your human nature will always direct you to it. Mm. Human nature pursues truth. Human nature pursues reality. Mm. Human nature, it's in your genes. So you have that impulse from within your genes. No one needs to tell you to try and discover reality. It's instinctive. Like a bird migrating to the Sahara Desert, humans migrate to truth. We pursue truth instinctively, we try to discover reality. And if a Muslim, a Muslim refuses to do that, then they are accountable for that rejection. Even if they don't refuse to do that, and upon their research of Christianity, they haven't got us so far as accepting Christianity yet. Yeah. Would that still be a mortal sin? Again. Okay, response. right. Pause. Uh, behind you, Bob. Is it? Oh great, I'm going to get chilly, but right, I, 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 okay, so I want to reply to that last point and, and maybe we bring this conversation to a close at this point. So my point to you is, ultimately all judgment belongs to God, I am not passing the judgment. All I'm doing is trying to pad out my understanding of mortal sin and venial sin. So each example you give, I'm, I'm, I'm putting through that prism to try and let you see what I believe about these things, right? With no, with no conviction in me that you have to agree with me that's also I want to make really clear because I don't think this is a salvation issue so you're entitled to disagree with me and I would still have fellowship with you I'd still have communion <laughs> with you I'd still give you the peace of our Lord yeah where's my umbrella let's stand under this umbrella okay now my, my point to you is my point to you is come here bro let's show you out of the rain my point to you is using your example okay the the, the, the a Muslim who does not pursue truth, right? Bearing in mind that God has put that law in his heart means that in that first instance, he's rebelling against what God has put in his heart, that instruction God has put but in his heart. That's throughout his pursuit of truth and right. he doesn't find it now, yet. Now, so if he does not find it, right, but he is pursuing sincerely, yes. then he, he will be judged according to what truth he has accepted. So in that, any truth that he accepts that is true, remember, not falsely thinking that something that is wrong is a truth, yeah. but any actual truth he accepts, it is that actual truth that he will be judged on. So if he actually accepts any truth, he will be judged on that truth, right? So if he accepts, for example, the crucifixion, but he doesn't accept that Jesus is God, he'll be judged based on what he accepted at, at that moment. He'll be judged on the truth as he accepts, but he'll also be judged on the lies that he tells. Lies. <laughs> if, he, if, he, if he asserts, right, if he, for instance, asserts something to be true that he knows is false, like lots of the Islamists do in the corner, when they say Christians believe in three gods, when they know damn well we don't. Because the Quran says so. 
Right, exactly. So they're asserting a lie, a lie. Because we have told them what we believe, but they have lied against us by saying and repeating the lies of the Quran. And you think it's based on their agenda? It's, it's just totally based on their... That Muslims are committed to upholding a lie because their Quran gets it wrong. So they have to lie. Islamists. Islamists. Well, uh, all Muslims. All Muslims. Uh, because the uphold, moment... All of them are uphold, upholding a lie. Um, all of them are upholding a lie the moment they know that it's not what Christians so they believe. It's not. Right. So if a Christian uphold, if, if something assert, if a Muslim asserts a lie that we know is a lie, yes. then they're going to be accounted for that lie. But if they only, uh, if they believe in ignorant things mm. because they've never been corrected, mm. then they're only going to be judged on the truth that they uphold. Mm. Right. But you said the core theological or doctrinal aspects of Christianity, yeah. which does uh, what well, contribute towards your salvation? Yep. If they don't know whether or not it's true, but I've done their research sincerely, would they be subject to mortal sin? Again, I say again, God ultimately is the judge. I am not the judge. So it is an important issue to talk about. N the, 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 it, I never said it wasn't. Mm. I never said it wasn't. I just said at the time of our conversation about uh, 1 Corinthians 16 13 that it wasn't the point I was trying to make. Mm. So the, and, 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 and it, we got sidetracked. So my point to you is that. You've got to remember, my understanding of sin is that we live in a fallen world. We ourselves are fallen, our nature is fallen. So we sin in all, and we sin in a myriad of ways. Even in our conversation today, as two brothers who love one another in the Lord, I firmly believe that I sinned. Because I know I got frustrated well, with you. Do you know what I'm saying? It was done through the intention of love. Right. Yeah, of course. But, but the thing is, I am not worried that my frustration that I felt towards you, even though I acknowledge it's a sin because it's not worthy of the glory of God, I don't believe that that is the kind of sin that means that I'm going to hell. Okay. I believe that is the kind of sin that John talks about in his epistle when he says, not all sin leads to death. Remember, the scriptures teach that the wages <laughs> of sin is death. But the scriptures also teach that not all sin leads to death, which means that there is a distinction about yes. sins. I accept that parallel, I accept the conditions you gave, but I do find it quite important, especially when you're evangelizing with Muslims, to know whether or not they are on the urge of committing a mortal sin or not. And what it is they must do in order to escape that if they're doing their own sincere research. Look, look let's, let's use a, an analogy to, to try and sort of wrap this whole point up, sure. right? Imagine a, a great river wide, torrent, deep, powerful, right? And there's a bridge over the river. You can try and swim across the river or you can walk across the bridge. Everyone who is not a Christian, who isn't following Christ, is trying to swim across the river. And by doing that, the chances are, like 99.9% .9 is that, and I'm just talking in terms of probability because we're talking mathematics, is that they are going to drown, right? In fact, no, let me be even stronger. Let me strongman my analogy. Let us say that the river is so far that no matter how strong a swimmer you are, you're going to sink and drown. You can still try and swim across the river and you will die. Or you can walk across the bridge. As a Christian, what should you be... Now, the bridge in this analogy obviously represents Christ. Yes. As a Christian, what you should be telling to people who wanted to jump in the river and swim? across the bridge even if that hypothetically probability wise there's a possibility that they might swim across you would still advise them to swim across the bridge yes. agreed and that's what it is in our relationship to Muslims we shouldn't worry ourselves whether they're acting from ignorance or whether they're acting from maliciousness but I guarantee 99% of the Muslims in this park are acting from maliciousness. <laughs> Not 99% of Muslims outside of this park, but 99% of Muslims in this park are malicious. But we should still, nonetheless, tell them to walk across the bridge. Yes. And we don't need to trouble ourselves with thinking, is this a Muslim who's ignorant or is this a Muslim that's malicious? We should still give them the same advice because it is the best advice to give. But if the Bible says something along the lines of do not cast pearls before swine or do not act, get engaged in what is it? Um, yes. Without any, like, I don't know the exact verse, but yeah. it's a verse it says, along do the not, lines of... It says do not cast pearls before swine for they may turn on you and trample the swirls and devour you. Yes. Yes. So why would you do it towards someone that is not listening and is malicious? Brilliant. The reason why, and that's a great question, very valid, good question to ask in this park. Why is it I know I'm debating people who are insincere, so they are the pigs that Jesus is talking about, 
and yet I still evangelize them. It's not because of them. It's because of the thousands of people that watch these videos. That's why I debate these insincere people. It's because of all of you people that are sincerely listening to me. I debate the malicious people and the insincere people here for you. I'm not casting pearls before swine. I'm casting pearls before good people. So you're taking on to yourself the burden for the sake of everyone else as a good evangelist? An evangelist must follow his vocation and his vocation is to reach the lost. And if I can reach the lost by standing in this corner and debating someone who I know is going to lie about me, he's going to lie about my faith and he's going to obfuscate and he's going to create red herrings and he's going to twist the words that I speak, but I can still reach people through the camera or sincere people listening in, then I will debate the Hashims, the Mansours, the Muhammad Hijabs and the Ali Dawas. And is that the same response you'd give to when Jesus wiped his feet, when dealing with those that would not listen to him? He didn't wipe his feet, he commanded his disciples to wipe his feet. He sent out the 70 and he said that if they reject you, smack off the dust from your feet, because that dust will testify against them on Judgment Day, because it will be easier for Babylon and Gomorrah, for, um, you know, so Sodom and Gomorrah than it will be for them on the day of judgment. So the idea is that as Christians, if we share the truth with people, right, when we have no responsibility about whether they take it, we have a responsibility in how we deliver it. Like, so we should do it intelligently and we should do it with emotional intelligence and sensitivity and if necessary, firmness. But we're not responsible if someone is courageous enough, strong enough or willing enough to embrace that truth. That's up to God. So don't, don't worry if people reject you. You should still preach. I'm not worried, it's just based on what the Bible says for you to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But this, this symbolic knocking off the dust, right, is, like, is this idea that when I speak to the insincere Islamists in this park, right, I know that they are heaping up judgment on themselves. Yes. By why would you want them to have more judgment against I don't, themselves? I don't. But if they are doing it to themselves, why don't. would you give it to I, them? I pray, I pray always for these people to become Christians. But I accept that I'm not dealing with sincere people. I'm willing to call a stone a stone. And if this particular stone-hearted person has made himself willfully an enemy of God, the judgment is on them, it's not on me. I didn't make them that way, they did. Based right? on what you've delivered onto them or based upon how they perceive you? Based upon how they have known the truth and rejected it. Known the truth or yes. misconstrued I guarantee view of the truth. Every Islamist in this park, right, and again... Justice Park. Every Islamist in this park, right? No, every Islamist everywhere that operates insincerely, they have had the Christian faith preached to them for years. They have heard that we Christians believe in one God. For years, they've heard us say that the Trinity is not polytheism. For years, they've heard us say and explain how Christ takes a humanity to himself without changing. If they hear that and then willfully ignore it and just repeat the same arguments, the problem's with them, not with us. The problem is with them, not with us. But, but, but the scriptures tell you not to worry you don't make, you're not the judge of another man's heart. You don't get to discern whether this person is acting from ignorance or from knowledge. You have a responsibility or I have a responsibility to try and educate them in the truth. And then they must answer before God for what decisions they make based on that information. That's fair. I agree with that, yeah. Yeah? Okay, bro, now let me give you a gift. Could you grab that? Sure. Because that was a really wonderful conversation. And I, I want to say, you know, I see you as a brother, right? Likewise. And, and, f and, and that kind of, for me, just homes out the point that I made earlier, that Christians can disagree about minor things without worrying that, um, you know, without worrying, for instance, that, that we, you know, like, that this is like a salvation issue, because not every issue is a salvation issue. So here's a gift for you. This is uh, Edmund Burke's Battle with Liberalism. Edmund Burke was a Christian politician and he fought against the ideology of liberalism at its birth when it was born in the 1700s and as Christians we should reject liberalism we should reject the liberalism of our society and we should see classical liberalism or progressive liberalism both including classical liberalism yes which talks about the freedom of yourself and others yes we should still reject liberalism because it's based on a religion of humanity but even then you can't 
conclude for the state to um, what practice a, a belief collectively? Well, I mean, that's a separate conversation. Have you got another hour? I haven't. Neither have I. So come back and we'll talk about why Christians should, should reject liberalism. Like an hour ago. But, but there's, that's my gift to you to Thank show you that this well. was a really beautifully spirited conversation. I really enjoyed talking to you. Likewise. Peace of the Lord be with you. And with you too. Brother. Thanks be to God. Thank you. Can you give about 300 of them to the members of the so called Conservative Hi, brother. Party? How are you? Good to see you. There's your. Yeah. Thank you so much. No yeah, very quick uh, roundup. So the brother was obviously passionate and he has a, a deep concern for the truth. And I want to laud him and I want to applaud him. And I also want to say how he is exemplary to you in that how firm he was to stand by what he believed. If only I could find Christians who had that firmness in all their beliefs. And he said on record that if, if there was a jihad against the church and the church organized a crusade to fight against it, he would join it. And I want to applaud his intention. I want to applaud him. But I do encourage him that follow through on your words, bro, because, yeah, you, if you're going to if you're going to be that kind of man, you've got to have the muscles to back it up with. Like, and, and this is the point, right? He's, the guy's got a good heart, and, and, and I celebrate that. But as Christians, we should be firm in our belief, but we should have dexterity in, in not making every single question of the Christian faith a matter of life or death. Christians can have points of disagreement and still love one another as Christians, even though they disagree. Leave the answer to God in the end, if you can't find the solution, if you can't find the truth. But as Christians, what we must be clear about is that there is only one truth. That truth is Christ and we should point people to that truth.